So, today is August 3rd, 2022. Let me start by saying that I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. Today I'll be doing uh, part one of a two-part series where I'll be talking about um, some thoughts I have about oil. Uh, specifically, uh, on, today's, um, on today's topic, we'll be talking about a company called Camber Energy. I haven't, uh, d I haven't done an update on Camber Energy in a while, and this will be an all-inclusive update. So let's start with the price of oil. Today, the price of oil uh, went down to sideways, and it's around $90 per barrel. But uh, what's interesting is that the 250-day moving average of oil is also around $90 a barrel. 200-day moving average is in blue, and it's been headed, it's been headed upwards. So uh, why do I care about the 250-day moving average? Well, if we look at it, if we look at the way we're measuring oil, okay, uh, each one of these bars represents one trading day, one day. And if we go back to, let's say, August, uh, I don't know, August 3rd or so, August, maybe 2nd. And uh, we'll go all the way up from August 2nd to August 3rd. Uh, that's 366 days, one year and one day calendar-wise, right? But that's equal to 260 bars. So 260 bars is about equal to one year of, uh, of, of trading, right? Uh, or one calendar year, I'm sorry, one calendar year, which is equal to 200, 260 trading days or so, about. And uh, so trading days are on the left, as we can see, because there are bars, and the calendar days are on the right, right? 366 days calendar-wise. So if we look at um, 200, the 260-day moving average, which takes the average of all of, of one year, approximately one year and one day, we see that the price of oil is $89.16. Uh, but uh, 260 is a, it's a slightly odd number, so, so most people will rely on the 250-day moving average, so we'll just change the setting on the chart to 250 days. And in that case, we get about a $90 price for the average price of oil over the course of a year. This would be considered what you know, a lot of people might consider a fair price for the price of oil, particularly if you plan to sell oil lands or anything like that. It's an average price going up around the whole year. It takes into account all the, you know, the lower price at the start of the year and the higher price later on in the year. But what's really interesting about today as well is the fact that the, you know, the price of oil seems to be dipping and heading towards the 250-day moving average. It did that. It did this in the past a little, you know. Uh, you know, a little around around November, December time frame of 2022, uh, 2021, and it's doing it again now. Uh, at that time, the, you know, the, the price rebounded upwards dramatically. Uh, could oil do the same thing? It's possible the price could, you know, could, could bounce off the 250-day moving average and go up. Uh, or it's possible it might drop below. You know, both, you know, both things are possible. But... Um, Interestingly enough, what's in the news is this Inflation Reduction Act, the inflation bill, but uh, it seems to have a perk in it for some oil, oil companies. And um, if we read this, uh, you know, this little bit over here, it, sees, it seems the Denver Pipeline in Montana is the only publicly listed U.S. company whose primary business is injecting carbon dioxide into the ground to produce oil. So oil companies are interested in doing carbon capture, uh, it looks like, and uh, they're viewing that as a, as a profitable business. But uh, that's, that's Denbury. And if we look at Occidental Petroleum, they recently just signed a four-year deal with Airbus for carbon credits, right? So, um, and Occidental seems to think that, um, you know, they're planning to spend $1 billion on a facility for carbon capture. Right, capturing carbon from the air. And uh, they think that the business could prove more valuable to investors than its chemical operations, which earned more than $1.5 billion in 2021. This could be big business, carbon capture, right? Clean energy could be pretty big. Um, and we see that uh, Berkshire Hathaway, you know, Warren Buffett seems to agree. Berkshire Hathaway increased its stake to 19.2% uh, of Occidental Petroleum you know, based upon new credits. Maybe they think the price of oil is headed upwards. Maybe they think carbon captures, it, you know, the next big thing. In either case, they're very pro-oil companies right now. And oil companies seem to be doing well. 
Let's look at uh, carbon capture from another standpoint. Uh, apparently, there's a little company called Canberra Energy. They recently secured an exclusive IP license for a patented carbon capture system. Uh, this is their press announcement. Um, the ESG Clean Energy System is designed to generate clean electricity from, in the, from internal combustion engines and utilize waste heat to capture 100% of the carbon dioxide CO2 emitted from the engine. Without loss, of, without loss of efficiency, and in a manner to facilitate the production of precious commodities such as distilled water, uh, urea, NH4, ammonia, NH3, ethanol, and methanol for sale. All of these, you know, all of these waste products are actually very useful as commodities that are sellable. So um, it's possible Canberra Energy could do quite well from, you know, from this ESG ca carbon capture system which is just a part of Canberra Energy, right? Canberra Energy is a more, much more complex beast, <laughs> as most of these oil companies are. So um, if we look at the corporate structure of Canberra Energy, for instance, we could see that um, they own 60, you know, about 60% of Viking. And Viking Energy has a lot of subsidiaries, and, they and part of that includes this ESG Clean Energy IP license that they have, right? Uh, which is, by the way, 100% exclusive uh, for for Canada. So they are They have a clean en clean energy systems license uh, uh, for the U.S. and a 100% exclusive one for Canada. So uh, so there are multiple catalysts that can cause Canberra Energy to go up in value. I think uh, in the near future, uh, we've talked about the clean energy one, for instance. Let's talk about oil and natural gas. All right. As we can see. Um, in terms of oil and natural gas, they are, you know, they have some oil and natural gas properties, and they are in the process of, of getting some more oil and natural gas properties, right? They're, they're looking at getting, according to this Form 8K that was released recently, they're looking at getting uh, 5,743 producing and non-producing oil and gas wells, okay? These are non-operated minority working interests, and... Um, and they currently are producing something like 18,000 barrels of oil per day and 686,000 MCF of natural gas per day. That's lowercase m, by the way. M, lowercase m stands for 1,000 uh, cubic feet. And, uh, and, the, and, you know, Camber could get approximately 2.24% uh, average interest in this. Now, the, you know, all of these, uh, the, these oil and gas wells are being, uh, op are being operated by Companies such as Chevron, BP America, ConocoPhillips, Occidental Petroleum, Devon Energy, etc. Right? Uh, these are, are big name oil producers, and they are, are running the wells. But um, you know, they don't necessarily have 100% um, ownership of the wells. In fact, they don't have 100% interest in the wells. So it's possible that Camber might, you know, you know, might get this 2.24% interest, which is pretty good, considering the price of oil has, has been is uh, high and headed upwards over the last year. But that's not the only thing they have. They also have, uh, have a division that's looking at something called open conductor detection. And you might be asking, you know, what that is. Uh, phase one is complete in terms of testing, and phase two, we're expecting some updates the uh, late July. In fact, some up updates have just happened, so I will go over that at the end of this video. But uh, open conductor detection is about forest fires, really, right? Because what happens is that utilities such as PG&E, so, so here's an article, for instance, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, has been blamed for several of California's wildfires in recent years. Um, and uh, forest fires are a big deal on the West Coast. Uh, they've, they're responsible for billions of dollars of property damage, as well as the loss of life and uh, loss of homes for people. It's just it's a horrible thing. But so... And the problem has not ceased to exist. It's continuing to go on. A lot of these fires are being caused by the electric power utilities. Uh, you know, they have a, a, these big transmission lines that transmit power. You, you know, these big transmission towers are, are transmitting power. And sometimes the wires break open. And when they break open, they arc. They, you get a plasma arc, right? They are, it's, a, it's like lightning is going across the two wires to create the circuit and um, and when that arc and plas you know when that uh, you know when that can you know conductor falls and hits the ground and hits dry leaves well you can imagine what lightning and plasma do to uh, dry leaves it basically sets them ablaze 
So this is about um, protecting property and protecting life and, uh, you know, making the world a better place. Mm. Good for them for actually having something like this, and hopefully they can, hopefully they can help out in California. It's a, it's a big deal there. The other thing they have is um, a, another interesting area is medical waste disposal. You might be asking, what are they doing with that? Why have they come across that? Well, th this came about because um, they happened to be uh, in, um, I think they were in, in the UK somewhere, and they came across a, uh, a group of hospitals, about 1,200 of them or so, in a, in a trust or something. And um, they found some people who had this, this way, this method of, um, of cleaning up uh, medical hazardous waste, medical biohazardous waste. If, you know, I mean, for anyone who's been around for the last two years and, and living through COVID, we know about all the masks and all the gloves and everything. All that stuff could potentially have, you know, viruses and germs on it and all that. And, that, you know, they need to be handled in such a way. Well, this uh, ozone technology can make sure that, you know, all of those, uh, all of that bad stuff is, uh, is taken care of. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, they came across this technology, and um, if, if we look at it, uh, the company's majority-owned subsidiary, Viking Ozone Technology, which is a new subsidiary, by the way, owns the intellectual property rights to a fully developed, patent-pending, ready-for-market, proprietary medical and biohazard waste treatment system using ozone technology. Ozone is O3, by the way. It's an unstable, it's an unstable oxygen atom, and um, it's highly reactive, so it will react with whatever is, is there. Okay. Uh, Viking's other majority-owned subsidiary, Simpson Maxwell Limited, is the exclusive worldwide manufacturer and vendor of the system. So there we go. That's where Simpson Maxwell comes in, into play. But yeah, yeah, they have this Viking ozone technology. It's, it's pretty good. So they have a, a wide variety of different things. They're a complex beast is the way I like to look at it. So let's look at their stock price, right? And their stock price is, is in the toilet. It's, uh, it's come down from, you know, a high last, what was it, last October or something like that of, uh, of almost $5 a share, all the way down to 37 cents now. So it's come down a lot, quite a lot. So the question comes up, the, ob the obvious question comes up, why is the price so low? What's going on here? <laughs> Well, they've got all these cool, wonderful things. What? what, what, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, this is why the price is low. There's a company called Carisdale Capital, along with other companies. Uh, Carisdale Capital is a short hedge. Is what's known as a short hedge fund. They short companies, which basically means they sell stock in companies that they don't own. Hopefully, borrowing the stock, but you know, who's to say? Anyway, they sell stock in companies that they don't own, hoping to buy back the stock later at a lower price. Okay. So Carisdale Capital, uh, they made an announcement that said, we are short Camber Energy, report is available, uh, blah, blah, blah. And um, they started shorting on October 5th. And what happened? This is what happened. <laughs> if we look at October 5th, uh, the, the price of the stock dropped dramatically at, the, at that announcement by Carisdale Capital. And they continued to short it all the way down to about 50 cents or so. Now, there was a brief... Uh, rise in price around March time frame because oil prices started going through the roof and as we know Camber, you know, Camber Energy has some oil properties so there you go but um, Carisdale Capital resumed the short attacks after the price of oil came back down a bit and now the price is around 37 cents so let's, let's, let's read their tweet again why are they shorting this you know, what, you know, what do they have going on here well, the first thing to note is that um, there is new management. So there, there was old management before at Canberra Energy, and the old management, I'm thinking, was either corrupt or incompetent, or both, most likely. The new, the new management is, uh, is, is here. It's, uh, it's basically James Doris. He's the new president and CEO of Camber, as well as the president and CEO of Viking Energy, right? So um, he's president and CEO of both. Canberra Energy acquires 51% of Viking. This took place on December 20th, 20, 24th of 2020. And the plan w is and was to merge the company, Viking Energy and Canberra Energy, into one company. But let's go back to uh, Carousel Capital and their tweet, right? What were they saying? So they said, we are short Canberra Energy. This, this one has something for everyone. Debt spiral financing, a fake CFO, delinquent filings, fired auditors three weeks ago, 
insolvent energy assets, and the saddest family of entrepreneurs in the clean tech vaporware space. Frowny face. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's take this, this tweet apart, okay? <laughs> Debt spiral financing fake CFO. Well, James Doris is the new CEO from Canberra Energy, okay? And he brought in a new CFO, okay? So this, uh, this fake CFO uh, that they're talking about, whoever he was, was in October 5th, 2021 time frame that they were talking about this. But there's a new CEO out there that, that has been brought in in 2022. And um, the new CEO is a really good guy. Anyway, series, uh, so in terms of financing and uh, debt spiral financing, they have, uh, they've actually uh, got Series G sh shares that were put into place as an insurance policy. And the plan is for the Series G shares to be redeemed, meaning that they are available and they'll be bought back, right? They've already retired also a lot of their Series C shares. This, their Series C shares could have resulted in a large amount of dilution to current uh, shareholders due to warrants and, and various other things. So they've retired 86% of that. So, um, so it's not really death spiral financing. All of that seems to have been taken care of as far as I know, or it's in the, or at least is in the process of 86% is basically being taken care of. <laughs> Let's see. Anyway, delinquent filings. Let's look at the delinquent filings. Well, Carousel Capital is hoping that Canberra Energy would be delisted way back in October, you know, when they tweeted this in October 5th, 2021. As you can see, they haven't been delis delisted. And in fact, all Canberra Energies and Viking filings have been brought up to date. Uh, this is when the filing dates actually took place. It took place on around May 18th to, to uh, May 20th. Everything got, uh, got taken care of. All of the filings, you know, there were eight financial statements that needed to be filed. So, the, so there was a fair amount of them. And, um, and they did get done. Their filings are all done. So that's, that's gone. Okay, next. Insolvent energy assets. Well, they seem to have sold some underperforming oil and gas assets because uh, uh, oil prices were, in, were increasing and uh, those particular oil and gas assets had a, had a high interest bearing accounts associated with them. And they're looking to buy more oil and gas assets, specifically the 5,743 wells that I mentioned, 18,000 barrels of oil per day, 668,000 MCEF of natural gas, 2.24% you know, uh, interest in that. So there you go. What about uh, the saddest family of entrepreneurs in the clean tech vaporware space? Well, is clean tech vaporware? Maybe, maybe not, who knows? But the, U the U.S. Congress is certainly interested in carbon and carbon capture as we saw by that uh, article earlier it, it, that worked its way into the, what is it, the, um, the inflation bill. Occidental Petroleum thinks it's a big business. They have a, they're investing $1 billion. They have a deal with Airbus to offset carbon credits. They think they, they plan to make more money from, you know, carbon capture than from their chemical operations. <laughs> so, uh, and also Warren Buffett seems to, you know, not have a problem with Occidental doing all that. If he thought it was, it was crap, I don't think, uh, I think he'd be saying something about it. But it uh, seems to me that, um, that their tweet has basically been debunked and uh, not really relevant anymore. But in either case, if we look at them, uh, uh, they have had an effect on the price of, of, uh, of Camber Energy. And in fact, the stock price has dropped significantly as a result of that. So uh, the question is, can what Kemper Hen Energy has, <coughs> which is this conglomerate of a lot of cool technologies, including carbon capture, oil and gas resources, open conductor detection, medical waste, and, as well as the Simpson Maxwell power solutions, uh, you know, can that offset you know that you know that big uh, you know that big short interest issue, right? Well, they also have one more thing that's coming along which I hinted at earlier, they, there was a plan, and there is a plan, to merge Canberra Energy and Viking Energy. So that means that they would become one company, right? And when they become one company, that means that shorts have to close their positions on Canberra Energy. And when shorts close their positions, that means forced buying. So what does forced buying mean to the potential price? Could it go back to where the price was before the short attack happened? Uh, well, I think that's not unreasonable, right? I mean, James Doris was making the company better all that time, and he's had a lot of a lot more time to increase the, you know, capabilities of Canberra Energy. 
So the company is doing even better now. So, and there have been a lot of improvements, right? So the situation is way, way better. They have carbon capture. They have open, you know, the open medical waste disposal. They have open conductor. They have natural gas, of course, as well as, uh, you know, so all of that, uh, you know, could mean that they could easily get back to there, right? So the shorts, if they merged, when they merged, the shorts have to close their positions, and that means forced buy, right? So what else can cause, uh, you know, forced buying? So when forced buying happens, what would happen, right? That would mean that Carousel Capital, who is a short, would be forced to buy Camber Energy. But uh, Carousel Capital is a company, right? They're a, they're a capital management company. So they have a lot more than just Camber Energy. Let's see. Let's look at Carousel Capital. Um, if we look at them... Uh, they recently made an announcement on December 14th of 2021 that they are short metamaterials. And they're saying metamaterials has no real revenue useful te or useful technology. Instead, it features a sordid history of disappearing segments, failed products, fake medical devices, and Twitter promotion-enabled capital raises. Uh, so they're shorting stock symbol MMAT metamaterials. Now, Metamaterials is kind of interesting because uh, they came about because of a merger between two companies, Metamaterials, the nanotech structures company, and another company called Torchlight Energy, which does oil and gas. In fact, you know, they have, uh, they had uh, a bunch of oil and gas that they were wildcatting, and they seem to have found some oil and gas, right? So, um, so these Torchlight shareholders, they, you know, they wound up with the metamaterial shares after the merger, but the Torchlight shareholders also got this thing called a Series A preferred shares, which is an interest in their oil and gas assets, right? Anyway, long story short, these Series A preferred shares got renamed somehow to the stock symbol MMTLP and began trading. MMTLP stands for Metamaterials Torchlight Preferred Shares, by the way. But there's a 49% revenue interest in about three, you know, but this, you know, this MMTLP represents about a 49% revenue interest in about 3.2 billion barrels of oil. And that's a brand new discovery in West Texas near El Paso. This is not offshore oil where you have to drill through water or th drill through, you know, the Gulf of Mexico or the North Sea to get to oil. This is oil that's on land. This is oil that's on land in Texas. This is oil that's on, la on land in Texas, near El Paso, near a major city, which cha just happens to have a refinery. Jeez, that seems really promising. Anyway, it turns out that um, this 49% revenue interest uh, is going to be spun out to a company called Nextbridge Hydrocarbons. They've already filed the S1 to spin out that company. And if when that happens, and that 49% revenue interest works out, their, um, you know, the value of that, of each share of MMTLP or, or Nextbridge could be anywhere in the range of 56 to $65 a share, you know, in terms of, ca it, it'll be a non-cash dividend because it'll pro most likely be a stock swap with some oil company or something like that to get, to, to get access to the, you know, to the assets. But in either case, the value is going to be somewhere in the range of 55 to $65 a share. And when that happens, uh, some portion of that will go back into metamaterials. And if some portion of that goes back into metamaterials, that could cause the stock price to go up. And if the stock price goes up, it could affect Caresdale Capital. And uh, anything that affects, you know, Caresdale Capital's short position affects Caresdale Capital itself, right? They might get a margin call. And if they get a margin call, that means all their short positions get closed. A lot of their short positions got closed. And what happens to Camber Energy? Well, Camber Energy stock could go up as a result of this. Camber en Energy stock could go up as a result of Carisdale Capital getting a margin call from another short they did on a company called uh, MMAT, Metamaterials, based upon the fact that um, some, uh, you know, some Series A preferred shares that represent oil and gas assets that have nothing to do with Camber Energy could pay off. That could result in in Camber Energy doing really well as Carisdale Capital has to close out their positions. You, you, you see how this this works out? It's 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 weird. I mean, Metamaterials could do really well through no fault of its own, through no you know through Carisdale Capital basically failing. 
and falling on their sword for stupidity. But, you know, that's to be expected. Anyway, so there are multiple paths, I believe, for, for uh, or catalysts for the success of Canberra Energy. You know, it's just, uh, who knows? Who knows what could cause this to go up? Anyway, the good thing about Canberra Energy is they have a CEO, uh, James Doris. He's got a vlog, uh, so he likes to keep people updated with his video log. And um, you should ch you, you, uh, I recommend you, 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 that you check it out. It's a, it's a good vlog. It's, he, he spends about two or three minutes talking about what's going on and, you know, keeps you updated. He's also got a nice Twitter feed. Uh, and Camera Energy has a Twitter feed as well, too. Um, so uh, subscribe to them. They're pretty active on social media. And they let you know what's going on, right? James Doris also has a Twitter feed as well as, as, well as their subsidiary, Viking Energy. So, so just... Um, you know, it, it's easy to keep up to date with what's going on. Let's look at, at, at see what one of their most recent tweets was, right? So, sometime around July 14th of 2022, James Doris made this tweet. Looking forward to the week of the 25th. And then he talks about, and he's got a link to Nyack Power. Nyack Corporation Power Systems, Simulations, and Consulting. So, uh, first thing you're thinking is Nyack Power. Okay, this probably has something to do with electrical power generation and transmission, so it's probably got something to do with the open conductor detection and preventing forest fires. So if you look at, um, at, their, at, at the June, uh, June 2nd vlog, there was a major electrical, you know, James, uh, James Dora said a major electrical provider was interested in licensing the open conductor technology and was waiting for the third party testing to be completed. Testing started at a facility in New Jersey. Well, Nyack Power Corporation is in New Jersey. <laughs> and on June 17th, he also made another vlog where he said, uh, we've completed phase one testing of third party testing. Phase two testing is expected, to be is, is expected to be in the third week of July. Well, that's around the third week of July or so. It's the 25th of July. So they're expecting some info and press release soon to be coming regarding this open conductor technology, it sounds like. And um, so, uh, so, on July 21st, we got this tweet from James Doris. So just got off with our engineer, the advanced bench testing of the relays to be used as part of next week's validation process in New Jersey went well. We're looking forward to next week. I will join them on Wednesday. And uh, he said, over the course, over the next few weeks, Viking Energy and Canberra Energy is, is to show demonstrative progress uh, with respect to the medical waste disposal technology and open conductor detection technology, each stand on their own and have great potential. Having both is even better. Plus, is even better. Plus, there's ESG. Three thumbs up. <laughs> what, what can you say? This was followed by about four tweets about uh, you know, which include pictures of of the uh, of the simulation that's taking place in New Jersey. The simulation and validation process going very well. Very interesting to be part of the discussions amongst our technical t technical team and NIAC team. Extremely bright group, fascinating. So great, con great continuing the discussion with Bob Stewart and Ron Smith, two of the brightest people in the nation. Testing going well, should be wrapped up by Friday. Viking and CEI, right? And this was followed, of course, by a um, a vlog that took place today. <laughs> so, uh, so James Doris uh, had a vlog today. Let's have a quick, uh, quick peek at a portion of that vlog. Uh, open conductor detection technology. I mentioned before that we were really excited for the week of July 25th. And the reason is that's when uh, third-party testing uh, of this technology was being conducted at an independent facility in New Jersey by a company called NIAC. They're well respected in that field. And so our engineering team spent uh, five or six days in New Jersey to go through the uh, testing plan, and that was completed on sat Saturday that just passed. So, uh, and everything went well. Everybody's extremely enthused <laughs> and very pleased with uh, how the week went. And so now we're just waiting for NIAC to produce uh, the independent testing report. And we were trying to pin them down on a specific time frame. Uh, they didn't want to commit, but we estimated it'd be a week, week and a half. My objective, subject to the approval of other managers and our legal counsels, I'd like to just publicly disclose that document. If we're allowed, I will definitely do that. But that's, uh, in our view, will serve as a catalyst to finalizing a uh, potential license arrangement with a manufacturer of protective relay devices, where you know our technology goes in the relay device. And this is a pretty state-of-the-art uh, relay device that's been designed by this manufacturer that has an international reach. And the, the goal is to finalize a license agreement with them in the, the, the near term, uh, followed by finalizing a monitoring arrangement with a global utility 
or I should say a large internationally recognized utility uh, to use the technology on a monitoring basis with a view to selling the technology, assuming that the monitoring phase is successful. Uh, so we're very, very encouraged. Uh, nothing can happen fast enough in the business world, but uh, these are important and necessary steps to complete these deals. And uh, you know, this is going to be a, you know, a long-term, very, very important pillar for the organization. So uh, uh, very, very encouraged by what happened. And we'll keep you updated as we're able to on uh, additional progress. So that's it for now. Thank you very much. So that uh, shows you an idea of the transparent and open communications that uh, is going on with uh, Canberra Energy and James Doris. Um, yeah, we could uh, actually we could uh, look at their entire uh, their entire vlog for now because the vlog is pretty cool. Let's let's have it here. Safe harbor and disclaimer. I thought it'd be helpful to provide another brief update on matters concerning each of Canberra Energy Inc., CEI, and Viking Energy Group Inc., VKIN. Before we get into the details, I want to emphasize, as always, that everything I say is subject to the public filings of each entity, as well as the disclaimer at the beginning of this presentation. We do not get involved in the day to day trading of the stock of either company. Uh, we're grateful for the support of all stakeholders and endeavor to be as transparent as possible as to things going on within the organization. So starting quickly with Canberra, some administrative housekeeping related items. You'll have observed that we filed a draft registration statement with respect to outstanding Series G shares. You remember we, we redeemed 50% of those shares before and had the ability to redeem the balance. So that was put in place as an insurance plan. And then the registration statement also relates to underlying common shares associated with warrants and convertible notes. Uh, we also scheduled an annual meeting. We couldn't have one last year because Canberra wasn't current with its filings, but now that we've addressed all the historical accounting issues, we can hold the meeting that was supposed to take place last year, combine it with the one that's take place this year. So that's scheduled for September 27th. We received inquiries today asking if the meeting has anything to do with the reverse split, and the answer is unequivocally no. Uh, Series C preferred shares since December 1st last year through redemptions and conversions, we've reduced the outstanding Series C preferred shares by over 86%, which is great progress. We got to eliminate all of them. At Viking, oil and gas, as many of you already know, we strengthened the balance sheet by selling assets that were subject to high interest loans. Uh, made material progress in that regard. We've entered into a conditional purchase sale agreement with respect to the proposed acquisition of new assets, and we're continuing due diligence on that front and also assessing new opportunities in that sector. Uh, Simpson Maxwell, we're assisting that organization with its expansion efforts into Ontario. We've identified a potential location for its Ontario headquarters and are taking steps to try to secure that location. Uh, the ozone technology, the medical waste disposal system, uh, you may remember that we arranged for, so Simpson Maxwell is the approved manufacturer and vendor of that system worldwide. We arranged for Simpson Maxwell to become an approved vendor within a hospital trust that manages approximately 1,200 hospitals in the United Kingdom. And the sales strategy is to sell an existing unit to one of the hospitals uh, within that organization, which they intend to use as their showcase to advance their green initiative and green agenda. And they believe the ozone uh, technology that we are offering is a significant part of that. So uh, no guarantees, but we're in the final stages of negotiating the sale of that first unit, and we're optimistic that'll be completed, and we'll update you if and when that happens. Uh, open conductor detection technology, I mentioned before that we were really excited for the week of July 25th, and the reason is that's when uh, third-party testing uh, of this technology was being conducted at an independent facility in New Jersey by a company called NIAC, they're well-respected in that field. And so our engineering team spent uh, five or six days in New Jersey to go through the uh, testing plan, and that was completed on Saturday that just passed. So, uh, and everything went well. Everybody's extremely enthused <laughs> and very pleased with uh, how the week went. And so now we're just waiting for NIAC to produce uh, the independent testing report. And you know, we were trying to pin them down on a specific time frame. Uh, they didn't want to commit, but we estimated the week, week and a half. My objective, subject to the approval of other managers and our legal counsels, I'd like to just publicly disclose that document. If we're allowed, I will definitely do that. But that's, uh, in our view, will serve as a catalyst to finalizing a uh, potential license agreement with a manufacturer of protective relay devices where you know our technology goes in the relay device. And this is a pretty state-of-the-art uh, 
relay device that's been designed by this manufacturer that has an international reach, and the, the goal is to finalize a license agreement with them in the, the, the near term, uh, followed by finalizing a monitoring arrangement with a global utility, or I should say a large internationally recognized utility uh, to use the technology on a monitoring basis with a view to selling the technology, assuming that the monitoring phase is successful. Uh, so we're very, very encouraged. Uh, nothing can happen fast enough in the business world, but uh, these are important and necessary steps to complete these deals. And uh, you know, this is going to be a, you know, a long-term, very, very important pillar for the organization. So uh, uh, very, very encouraged by what happened. And we'll keep you updated as we're able to on uh, additional progress. So that's it for now. Thank you very much. So that's it for now. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, so I, uh, because there's so much stuff going on here, uh, for my own, for my own purposes, I keep uh, a, a nice little, st you know, status panel of as to what's going on with Canberra Energy. <laughs> uh, as you can see, there's about five different things going on. The CEO vlog updated. Uh, this last CEO vlog happened to update um, almost all of them. Uh, the only thing that wasn't talked about here was uh, uh, the ESG carbon capture system, uh, which uh, a demonstration of that technology is taking place in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And it, uh, that demonstration will be a catalyst for marketing efforts in Canada, uh, as well as, as marketing efforts in the United States as well, too. So, um, yeah, so with the Open Conductor, they've, uh, they're awaiting the final report from NIAC, and they're estimating one to one and a half weeks, it looks like. Um, so the, the testing has gone well. We can tell from the body language and how, how pleased James Doris was. He, he is the CEO of Canberra Energy. We can tell by his reactions that he's very, very happy with that, and he thinks that's going to move along quite well. Um, he seems very happy about you know, the ozone medical waste disposal as well, too. He's, uh, you know, he's saying that the, he's, uh, he's in the final stages of negotiation of the first unit uh, you know, to be uh, you know, for... 12, you know, to a hospital trust. There's uh, 1,200 hospitals in the UK, uh, potentially in there, and it's the first unit is to be a showcase for their green in green initiative. So um, he did, uh, at the start of this uh, vlog, happen to talk about the fact that filings were completed, that an annual meeting was called, and um, that is indicates that uh, that the merger is is likely to be uh, talked about at the annual meeting, and we'll will be moving forward then at that point because the merger is what he's talked about in the past, and it's it's uh, it's where Canberra Energy needs to head too. So um, let's see. He also talked about redeeming of the series uh, C preferred shares. About 86% of, of them have been redeemed. And, um, and he talked about the outstanding Series G shares, which um, he, is, uh, he is redeeming those as well, too. So let's see. Uh, so again, we've got possible catalysts of open conductor, uh, ozone-based medical waste disposal, right? We've got ESG, carbon capture. We've got a very large short position by hedge funds as a catalyst, right? And then there's the merger of Viking Energy. So that's a lot of possible, you know, any one of these things going, you know, taking off could propel the stock of Canberra Energy. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is, this information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. I'm just reminding you. So what is, a, what would be considered a reasonable price target for Canberra Energy, right? Well, you know, how about going back to just where they were in, at the last 52 week high, right? Which is just before the short attack. So and that was around five dollars. So five dollars does not seem unreasonable because that was where they were, right? Uh, and in fact, they could, uh, you know, maybe double, triple, quadruple, quintuple that. What about that? You know, that's uh, that's that's possible. And given the short attack, it doesn't seem unreasonable that that that, that could happen easily, right? And so doubling five dollars is ten dollars. You know, quintupling five dollars is twenty-five dollars. It's it's. It, it's not unreasonable. Let's put it this way. Could it go higher? Um, the answer is who knows? Maybe. You know, we have all this, all the, these cool technologies like open conductor, medical waste, ESG carbon capture, and you know, given high oil prices in the foreseeable future, current and foreseeable future, it looks like uh, you know, it looks like they're buying you know more producing wells, or at least an interest in more in more producing wells. It looks like you know. It, it could go potentially significantly higher. Who knows? Who really knows? You know? 
a short squeeze is possible. So um, again, this, uh, this is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. This information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. And so these are some thoughts that I had about uh, you know, oil and camber energy specifically. Um, part two is going to talk about torchlight metamaterials and MMTLP, or the next bridge hydrocarbons. Uh, and uh, that, uh, it'll, that is also an oil play. And as we saw, next bridge hydrocarbons and MMTLP can affect Carousel Capital, which can affect Camber Energy. It's possible that Camber Energies can affect uh, Carousel Capital, which can affect metamaterials. <laughs> So, <laughs> right, because we have a common short among among the two companies, Camber Energy and uh, Camber Energy and Metamaterials are both being shorted by the same company, Carisdale Capital. So, if I, if anything take if any one of those short positions fails badly, that takes down Carisdale Capital, which means the other you know the other short positions get blown up as well too. And again, uh, this is just you know I'm just saying this is. Uh, this is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. This information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. And um, these are, are some thoughts I had about oil. So uh, with that, I'd like to say uh, goodbye. <laughs>